Tenakoto Katoa, on behalf of the Asia New Zealand Foundation, a very warm welcome to everyone joining us this afternoon for this important discussion on Myanmar. My name is Susanna Jessup and I'm your moderator for this session. On the 1st of February this year, the Myanmar military, known as the Tatmadaw or Junta, seized power in a military coup, deposing the democratically elected civilian government and detaining its leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. Since then, there's been widespread resistance to military rule, from villagers taking to the streets in protest through to thousands of healthcare and other government workers walking off their jobs. As time has passed, protesters have become more organized with formalized political and armed resistance. The response from the military has been sustained and violent. Over 1,000 civilians are estimated to have been killed, tens of thousands displaced, and millions are now struggling to access basic supplies and services. A situation made significantly worse by the COVID pandemic and an economy that's in free fall. Over the next 50 minutes, we're going to be taking a closer look at the situation on the ground in Myanmar and examining some of the steps being taken by governments, NGOs, civil society, regional leaders, and others to deliver essential support to the people of Myanmar while pushing back against the military. Our conversation is going to be led by four outstanding panelists. The Right Honourable Helen Clark, who we've just heard as keynote speaker, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, former Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, and current day leading global advocate for rights, development and democracy. His Excellency Steve Marshall, New Zealand Ambassador to Myanmar since 2016 and former Head of the International Labour Office in Myanmar for eight years. Mr Ross Wilson, Chair and Founder of Union Aid, former President of the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions and Myanmar Development Specialist. And finally, Dr Nayant Nai Thin. Myanmar consultant and health expert who's joining us from along the Thai-Myanmar border, where he's helping to deliver and coordinate essential services to ethnic communities. In 2006, Dr Nye was awarded the Queen's Service Medal in New Zealand for his outstanding service to refugees and migrants. Uh, finally, to you, our audience, um, if time allows, at the end of our discussion, we will take your questions, so please do use the, the question panel below the live screen for any questions you'd like to submit for discussion, and the chat function to the right of the screen for any comments you might like to share through the course of the exchange. I'd now like to turn to, to Dr Nye, um, and I'd like to start by giving our viewers a sense of what it's currently like on the ground in Myanmar. What is this situation for everyday people caught already as a developing country grappling with development challenges between contending with the COVID pandemic and a military coup? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak in this distinguished panel. As um, Susanna mentions, I'm in the Mesau town. It is in the Thailand-Burma border. So at the, about nine months now, the military attempted a coup and then now military brutally kill own citizens across a country and the attempt to take the full control of the countries. You know, like the update from the yesterday is more than a thousands, actually 1199 people being killed, including 75 children at least. And then they're arresting more than 9,000 people, including Hauke walkers. And then more than 7,000 7, people are still in detained. With current, brutally oppressive. It is a more than 300 people flee away from their country. It's added the more than half a million people in the displaced around the country because of the result of the more than decades of the civil wars. Now the estimated 3 million people are neat in the emergency situations. And new dynamic, it's not only in the border areas and also urban, very urban area like in Yango, Mandalay, and the other cities around the country are in the problems. And a lot of displaced people, they have a lack of food, clean water, shelter, medicines, and lack of health care. And they daily need assistance. Women being forced to give parts while they were run in the jungles without any medical assistance. And many children, elderly, are starving without humanitarian aids. Government prohibited humanitarian aids in all Counts that they can do, including UN organizations. 
A lot of people join civil disobedience movement. Actually, it is a non-violence way of the protesting that the people, what they couldn't accept it. So now, now many people are in hiding. Many are in the border area of the ethnic control area. Actually, it's across the border where I sit now. So now military does not allow humanitarian assistance in the many area inside Burma, that is a big problem. Now in the delight of the COVID-19, the third wave in July, actually military opened fire against the people who queuing up to fill up their oxygen bottles. That, that is a very terrible situation. And then they use vaccine as a weapons to try to against the will of the people. The current Myanmar currency drop against the international others currency and the bank system are quite deteriorating and the people even cannot withdraw their own saving. Our country is an agriculture country, more than 40% of the GDP come from. Now, farmers are running from their home to jungle and the military set far villages and threatens to arrest them. You know, at the, most of the young female German workers lose their job. Constructions and much on stills or restaurants and other services close around the country, including other essential services like the healthcare, schools, and you name it. Economy is in the state is a very difficult situation, and the forced internet provider to disclose personal information, including banking systems, and block the social media like Facebook, WhatsApp, and so on. They change the law as they want, and then they claim they do according to the laws. And then they equipped the weapon to the paramilitaries on their sites. Now these people also abuse power and the threat in the civilians. So at the moment we suffer compound effects, conflicts, COVID, coup. It's a crisis on top of crisis at the moment. Thank you very much. Thanks Dr. Nye for that um, very sobering readout. Um, I'd now like to turn to Steve. Um, as someone who has until fairly recently been living in Yangon and as New Zealand's current ambassador to Myanmar, I wonder if you could describe to us what level of political engagement is currently happening with Myanmar. Are there negotiations at all with the military to restore democracy and bring about peace? Or is the very notion of negotiating with the junta who have taken power by force a complete anathema to the people of, Viet of, of Myanmar? Well, thank, thanks very much, Susan. Um, there's a number of initiatives taking place at the moment uh, that we know of, and there's probably others that we don't know of. Let's be quite frank about it. Um, we've got the, the ASEAN initiative, which people widely have been supporting and which Helen just briefly discussed in her last session. That at the moment doesn't appear to be going dreadfully far dreadfully quickly, but it is a, a, a structured initiative which is valuable. There's also the, the UN Special Envoy, who has been very active in talking to all of the stakeholders within, within the country, looking for opportunities to progress some form of dialogue. Then you've got a thing called the expanded PPST, which is the, the signatories of the nationwide ceasefire agreement uh, plus a couple of other of the ethnic organizations. Um, and they have indicated that they see that the nationwide ceasefire agreement political dialogue provisions could be a foundation for some talks at some stage when the time is right. Their vision, of course, being that it be an inclusive structure for talks. And then you've got the Tatmadaw which who have been quite open and, and about it, transparent about their talks that they've been having at the moment with political parties and with other ethnic organizations. Um, their view also is that the nationwide ceasefire agreement could provide a platform, but they're very, very adamant that actually it is not an inclusive process. They would see the NUG and others being excluded from that process. So we've got some initiatives already in place, but what we need to accept is that dialogue, um, if it gets off the ground, 
must be something that is actually accepted by the key protagonists. Um, mediation can't be imposed from outside on unwilling participants. It just doesn't work. And to be frank, there is very little appetite at the present time for true inclusive dialogue, mainly for two reasons. One is, is there's a complete absence of trust between all of the stakeholders. Uh, and the second is that at the moment, everybody thinks they can win. Or put another way, nobody yet is prepared to consider that they could lose. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, at the moment, what we're seeing is actually all the parties being focused very much on in two issues. One is, is recognition with the SAC requiring looking for recognition of themselves as a legal entity and with the NUG and the CRPH looking for recognition as the properly elected, but now not an authority government of the country. Um, the other thing that is driving people at the present time is accountability. And it's interesting in that the SAC is looking for, SAC is looking for uh, accountability against people attacking their institutions. And of course, the NUG and others are looking for accountability for the alleged atrocities of, of the SAC and the Tatmadaw. One of the things about accountability, of course, is that it's very black and white. Accountability is not something that is negotiated. Um, and it's not... A, an entrance point for dialogue. So at the present time, the reality is, is that there are these blockages to dialogue proceeding. Uh, the, um, it's good that people sort of are doing their preparatory work. It's good that they're doing their preparatory work, but um, it's really not at the present time the the will, if you wish, to actually get into dialogue. So at the present time, they're, they're undertaking their preparation. They're getting into a position where they've got the foundations for talks, and that's good. Um, but they don't see that it is time yet. And so what we're seeing, the sad reality, is that actually possibly the critical health issues that have been spoken about from COVID the humanitarian issues that have been spoken to by Dr. Nang could, in fact, be one of the very few conduits towards dialogue that currently exists. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Steve. I think that's a that's a nice segue into perhaps sort of widening our lens out um, to the region. Um, Helen ASEAN has been grappling with the question of who it was going to allow to represent Myanmar at its summit today happening in Brunei. I wonder if you could share your observations on how effective within the context Steve's just talked about ASEAN regional engagement has been to help either deliver essential services, quell the violence or sort of pressure or prize a return to democracy in Myanmar. Well, I, I for one, was actually pleasantly surprised that uh, ASEAN stood up on the issue of not permitting the military leader to attend the summit. They said you can send someone who's non-military, maybe civil servant, whatever, but but you can't come uh, from 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 the military. And I think that really is a whack at the at at the regime, and. Quite extraordinary, really, when you think of the composition of ASEAN, because it's not as if it's, you know, the other nine countries in it uh, are beacons of human rights, freedom and democracy. You have still uh, you know, three uh, outright authoritarian regimes in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, you have uh, Thailand, which, uh, as we know, is, is, is very complicated, where the military uh, continue to be very uh, powerful. You have the, the Philippines, um, well, eclectic. Uh, Indonesia and Malaysia have, have really pushed uh, on this. Uh, 
and Brunei has pushed as as the chair, and and Singapore has also expressed concerns. Right. So it, it's quite a divided uh, organisation. So to to get to where it got to uh, around this week, I, I I'm actually impressed that it, that it got that far. It's very very hard for ASEAN to to wrestle with something like this because of its it, its composition. Uh, but uh, I think that you know ASEAN is one of the most important games in, in town because uh, Myanmar, if it military, if they're you know, wanting a way back, they have to you know, satisfy ASEAN and let's hope that ASEAN keeps the bar where it's established it uh, now. Now, it's obviously also important what, what China thinks. And uh, if the US and China can come uh, on broadly the same page, uh, and support ASEAN uh, as, as it wrestles with it. That That is useful uh, as well. Uh, I, I would say ASEAN's major contribution to make here in the, in the diplomatic uh, sphere and in, in trying to you know, find a way forward, but uh, let's agree with everything Steve said about it, it, it's not just that Myanmar military have obstructed the special envoy and the rest of it. It is that at the moment, that there's not a great appetite for dialogue either between respective parties uh, in Myanmar while everyone thinks that maybe they can win. Uh, so I think you know, the best strategy for New Zealand is to hang in behind the ASEAN five-point consensus to uh, be continuing to engage with China and the US as, as extremely important uh, players in, in this as well. And, and keep urging for a, a path back to democracy, rule of law, and constitutional government, which is mm. none of which you have at the moment. Mm. Thanks, Helen. I'd, I'd like to dial, delve into the sort of those those major power relationships in a in a little while. Um, but I wonder, Ross, if I could turn to you um, as someone who's lived and worked in and with the people of Myanmar for many years, but also someone who's engaged with private sector and development agencies and others. Um, fr from what you can see, what means and channels are currently available to governments and aid agencies and others, noting this complex political environment to get supplies in and to get support to the people of Myanmar, while not um, inadvertently supporting the, Myan the, the Myanmar military while doing so? Uh, thanks, uh, Suze. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa and mingla bā to Dr Nai over there in um, Maysot. Um, yes, well, of course we have, as, as Dr Nai has graphically described, a real humanitarian crisis in Myanmar, and one would expect that this crisis created by COVID, by the coup, and by the uh, resultant collapse in the economy, uh, that there would be a UN-coordinated um, global effort to to relieve the situation, but of course that's been um, impeded by the by the junta to date. Um, I guess if we look back to a similar uh, situation, at least in terms of the impacts in 2008 with the uh, cyclone Nargis uh, disaster. The, the military regime did then eventually allow uh, international assistance, and that actually became a model for what can be done. And it was then that we saw the flowering of relief and development um, activity, which provided a, a really life-changing opportunity and experience for many thousands of young people who went on really to build that huge growth in community organizations, uh, NGOs, and unions, which we've seen in Myanmar over the past 10 years. So that's still a possibility, but at this stage, the Yunta is saying no international aid effort, nobody's getting in here. Um, those same young people as CSO and union leaders have led a remarkable uh, opposition to the coup through the civil disobedience movement with self-sacrifice and courage, which has effectively prevented the Yonta from gaining control over the machinery of government, ministries, health, education, transport, banking systems, down to village administration. So we've seen how the, the Yonta's brutally responded to that, shooting health workers who are providing community services 
arresting people, as Dr. Nye said, who are trying to fill their own oxygen tanks. So we move to what's the CDM and the National Unity Government and the Cynthia Mung Health Task Force um, doing to assist the situation because they're, they're, they're the alternative. Um, and they represent the popular will of the people and really the hope for a democratic future, as well as in the shorter term being the primary vehicle for humanitarian support and development assistance through their extensive um, civil society networks, including all of those young people who are leading um, NGOs, unions, and CSOs. The how is a bit more difficult. Um, I mean, we as Union Aid, and I'm sure other organizations also, have managed to get significant monies uh, into Yangon uh, and other places within Myanmar to support CDM workers in particular, including a thousand railway workers who were thrown out of their homes for uh, supporting uh, CDM. But more recently, banking restrictions um, imposed by the Junta, including daily withdrawal limits and transfer delays, not to mention uh, increased scrutiny of foreign transfers means that it's, it's almost impossible to get funds in through those sources uh, now. So that's given rise to the, uh, the, the reinvention of traditional informal systems such as the Hundi, the, the old uh, colonial Indian system, uh, enabling cash to be transmitted through local uh, cash traders or trusted contacts but usually uh, they attract quite high commissions. And of course, there is uh, some significant risk with that sort of system. But it's there and it's being used and it's being used for quite large amounts. And Steve will remember when he used to come uh, across from Bangkok in the early days with his bags bulging with um, US dollar notes. People carry <laughs> currency across borders. Um, another option is cross-border aid. And that's probably looking to be the most viable at the moment. Um, at the Thai Burma border, May Sot, where Dr. Nye is, uh, in particular, there's a well established network um, going back a long time that has uh, effectively provided uh, in the past much of it through the Thai Burma, Burma Consortium, Thai Border Consortium, for example, uh, which the New Zealand government has contributed to. And of course, mm. Dr. Cynthia Mung's famous. Uh, May Tail Clinic um, operates from uh, very close to May Sot. So such an approach of support uh, there would enable support for, um, for the uh, task force and the NUE, NUG work. Yeah. The problem yeah. with that is that that cross-border aid wouldn't immediately reach um, the majority of those in need, um, but because they, they live obviously much further away from the border, but utilizing those networks, there, there is potential to reach further inland, inland over time. It's, I think it's significant that uh, a few days ago, a US State Department official met with the Thai foreign minister, I think it was last Thursday, and it was announced following that meeting that Thai US humanitarian assistance may be channeled through that Thai Burma, uh, Thai Myanmar border um, channel. So that's looking like, um, a place to to watch. Other yeah. borders, of course, mm -hmm. India and China also provide the same potential in the north and and, and northwestern areas uh, of Myanmar. Thanks, Ross. Um, I, I might turn now to Dr. Nye, um, who's sitting along that border, um, who can perhaps give us his take on on what he sees as the most urgent humanitarian needs are and how uh, Dr. Nye, in your view, should and can uh, New Zealand donors respond, noting the, the challenging political context. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I really want to acknowledge what Ross said. It's a Ross said the sense of the internal, the general, especially highlight for the cross-border assistance. So now I also continuations in the little, little bigger picture of the international communities, donors and government, including New Zealand government, we really would like to request direct support to the ethnic service provider, community-based organizations to make it to provide the cross-border assistance. At Ross also articulated about the, uh, the border consortiums I have a connection with in the Dr. Cynthia and Meta clinics. So these people can be consortiums together and able to, we can mobilize the international's fundings. 
So I'm, I'm here also coordinating uh, these kind of efforts. So whatever uh, that I can contribute it, I'm more than the welcome. Uh, another one is that Ross also mentioned that I really want to a little bit more detail here. It is something like, you know, humanitarian assistance platforms, like what Syria is happening on the neighboring border, and the UN OCHA is taking care of that. In, in our case, maybe AHA, it's the ASEAN humanitarian assistance, or something like the Helens and also, uh, uh, um, you know, Ambassador Steve and then Ross, you can also have a, your power and the positions that you can also uh, uh, make it happen. And because the inside Myanmar, organizations, uh, they also need it, but very, very difficult to moving around internal banking systems and all sort of restrictions. So through border area, we can also immediately reach to the people who are hiding in the jungle, more closer to the border. Cross the Thailand border is also very difficult because of the COVID situations. So something like, you know, Red Cross, it's a very neutral ICRC maybe even New Zealand Red Cross and the ICRC can be able to work together with the Thailand, India, China, maybe. At the moment, I can talk only for the Thailand and a little bit far away from the other border. So that is a one thing that what we are proposing. And then one thing that what we are really scared about is that the COVID-19, it Burma can be a breeding ground to develop the new strains. Who knows? It is a challenge for the regions and, and also for the, 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 the global pandemic. So, you know, and what I would like to say is that the military must be held account for their complete, you know, disregard of whatever happens that they do for the life of the people. And then their inhumanity should not be legitimized. So neither government or ING or humanitarian organization. I know that even UN organizations are very difficult to walk inside Myanmar. So I really appreciate everybody's comments. And then I really want to uh, request, uh, including New Zealand and the internationals, uh, donors to walk in for the cross-border platform that it's also Ross also um, as a highlighted that I'm here to helping to facilitate and I really look forward to working with you all. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Nye. Um, I wonder, noting you, you mentioned that the need to build partnerships, um, Steve. If I could turn to you. Um, mm -hmm. Could you share your observations about the role and response of Myanmar's largest neighbours, China and India in particular, but also the more distant players, but who are equally involved, like US, Russia? I mean, we know they have their own political interests, but there's also private sector interests, there's arms sales, there's other investments at play. Um, what do you see, you know, what are the role that major players, powers are, are playing? Mm. Okay, um, I've got no major insider information on this, I can assure you, but uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk about it in terms of information that's on open source, uh, or frankly, is simply logical observation and common sense and extraction from that. Um, it's important, I think, that again, we remind ourselves that Internal stakeholders will make the final decisions on where the direction of this goes. Um, but there is absolutely no question says that the external players can influence that quite considerably. So there's really two essential groups. One is the immediate neighbours. Um, and if we talk about them very briefly, um, they have actually had issues of Myanmar and conflict inside Myanmar for many, many years. This is not a new experience for them, um, but it has been seriously exacerbated in the, since the coup. Uh, and what we are seeing is neighbours, all of the neighbours, seriously concerned about the number of IDPs that are arriving on their border, political or economic, um, and the number of artillery shells and other high explosives that are getting extremely close, if not crossing their border. Um, they are really, really keen on stability inside the country in terms of their border position. Um, obviously, COVID issues are really important to these people as well. So if you take, for example, Thailand, which Dr. Nang obviously would know much better, but the Thai government response, I, I think, is, is actually exacerbated by the issues of migrant workers, for example, 
the, the huge numbers of workers who for COVID and coup reasons have lost their jobs either in Thailand or in Myanmar who are now trying to cross backwards and forwards. This really exacerbates the situation for Thailand in the way in which they respond. Um, India is in a similar position. They are, have got really the COVID concerns, but their situation is exacerbated on two other counts. One is they have a major investment in what's called the Caladan project, which is a, a, a transportation system through the river system, essentially, and road. Um, they're keen, obviously, to protect that investment. It, it's massive. Also, um, they have got their own issues in respect of insurgencies within uh, groups who are either inside Myanmar or on the border of Myanmar. And this is being exacerbated by the current destability inside Myanmar. So then you look at China. Okay? Um, China shares exactly the same COVID-related IDP issues on their border as do the others. They are seriously concerned about border management and border control. Stability on that border and in the region, however, appear to be one of their key priorities. Um, they have got big investments to protect. They've got their oil and gas pipelines. They've got their current projects looking at, at deep sea ports in the Indian Ocean. They're looking at SEZ development. So they are keen for the stability for a range of issues. Um, we're not yet talking about the broader geopolitics. We're talking about largely commercial investments. So they are definitely seeking the stability. And it's really interesting that some of their approaches um, would appear that they are principally concerned about peaceful solutions being achieved. They are not interested in, in conflict. Um, there is, however, very much pragmatism coming to the fore in some of China's approaches. Now, if we then look at the other players, the non-neighbors, um, the more distant players, I would suggest that regional security, regional stability with security, economic investment and trade as the main considerations and their concerns for this issue. Yes, some countries quite correctly are driven by democratic principles and human rights prerogatives without question. Um, but in terms of these external players, the more distant ones, Russia stands out um, mm. in that uh, Russia is one of the only countries that has actually indicated support for, uh, for the regime, recognition of the regime. Um, they've had a long standing relationship, military relationship with Myanmar. They are a major provider of military equipment. Uh, and the reality is, is that most senior officers within the Tapador have had their training or from or with uh, the Russians. So their approach, however, is not purely commercial. I think you'll find also that Russia is looking for a place within the region to consolidate their positioning within the region. So this may be an opportunity. Um, but in terms of the geopolitical positioning, I think you'll find that uh, most people are looking to use Myanmar's situation to strengthen their position or at very best not to weaken their situation. They, they're looking to, to ensure that they can sustain their position. And again, I have to say that actually, if you look at the positions, there is common ground and that there are, they're all looking for stability and they are all actually concerned about the humanitarian issues. And once again, those two could be the areas that will start bringing the international community together. Thank mm. you. Yeah, thanks very much, Steve. And I think um, as, a, as a number of commentators have suggested so, the, the flip side of that is also stemming that flow of arms um, yep. that, are, that are on the ground in Myanmar. Um, Helen, if I could turn back to you, um, 
I, you must get a lot of questions that, that start with as the former administrator of the United Nations Development Programme. <laughs> but um, basic, as someone who's as former Prime Minister and someone who's really observed and worked within that wider UN system, what's your view on what more the UN or other similar larger multilateral bodies could be doing in response to the situation, situation in Myanmar? And what um, uh, should the UN do, uh, but you hold perhaps a little hope that it will? <laughs> well, un unfortunately, you know, geopolitics is so toxic at the moment that the UN organisations are often reduced to uh, pleading for humanitarian assistance in the absence of being able to make a meaningful contribution to, to pushing a, a peace process forward. Uh, the, the UN uh, Security Council has been very polarised on Myanmar. Myanmar has obviously had some cover from, from China uh, and, and, and some cover from Russia, both uh, veto holding uh, powers. Uh, what was very significant was the debate and the vote in the UN General Assembly, uh, where there was a very strong resolution passed uh, by the membership, 116 votes to one, with quite a lot of abstentions, uh, which called on Myanmar armed forces to respect the will of the people uh, at the last election, uh, and called on all countries to stop you know, selling arms to Myanmar. Interestingly, the one vote against was Belarus, and you know, people have probably noticed that, that they have their own um, major uh, re repression going on of anyone opposed to the president, the regime there. Interestingly, uh, China and India were among the abstentions on that uh, resolution. There is a view that China doesn't want to be sort of seen as completely in the dog box with a, you know, a, a vicious regime. Uh, so it gives it a certain amount of cover, but not not uh, total, as it were, and, and did have a good relationship with Aung San Suu Kyi. So uh, a General Assembly resolution doesn't carry any force of international law, but I think it was a pretty good expression of where uh, the, the strong majority of the uh, countries of, of the world uh, were on this. So the UN has a special envoy in the process of being replaced, if that hasn't al already happened, but uh, the existing special envoy had not been allowed to enter Myanmar, so that makes things a little difficult. However, her, her office has continued to you know, have contact with all sides. Uh, to some extent, uh, and the special envoy has regularly briefed the Security Council, so and has briefed in pretty forceful terms, which makes it all the more disappointing, really, that not more is is said from there. There's also the um, sort of charade being played out around the uh, credentials committee uh, of the UN as to who will be recognised as holding the seat. Uh, that's been kicked for touch by some kind of deal we understand between. China and the United States, where the existing ambassador, who was appointed by the democratically elected regime, continues in place but doesn't say anything. So that's obviously not that satisfying uh, for him at all. So you know, that, that's the geopolitics of it. I think it is extremely important uh, to keep pressure on for uh, the Security Council to continue to be briefed, to ideally uh, work towards some. Um, a resolution which is which is up to date uh, on the issues, hard as that will be. And then, of course, to support the international agencies doing the work they can still do in, in Myanmar with respect to uh, food and humanitarian relief. And, you know, if you know, the regime will allow you know, support through through vaccination supplies into mm -hmm. Uh, the country, but it, it's a bit it's a bit depressing, really, that there can't be a more forthright um, political response. Yeah, thanks, Helen. I, I mean, you could say that across a number of um, challenges facing the world today, right? I, th I think you're right there that um, we still need to take those statements and those moments of solidarity um, and use them as much as we can. Ross, can I bring you back into the conversation? And bef just before I do, um, to our audience, um, there is an opportunity to ask questions. I've got 
one ready to go here. But if you would like to ask our wonderful panelists a question, um, I think we're tracking to have 10, 10 odd minutes um, for that. So just pop them in uh, the question box below. Um, but Ross, turning back to you um, and turning specifically to New Zealand and our audience tuned into this conference today, I wonder if you could give us a sort of cast forward and, and share your thoughts on how in the midst of, of a crisis can NGOs and donors and civil society support the, the future needs of the people of Myanmar? What is the sort of key message, I guess, you would like to give everyone tuned into this discussion today that's beyond just the immediacy of the, of the crisis that, that Myanmar is currently addressing? Thanks, Suze. Um, well, I think thinking of future needs, I, I think that the future that Myanmar people aspire to is pretty universal. They want a peaceful country where they can earn a living, live happily and provide their children with a better future. They saw that future emerging during the transition to democracy over the last 10 years, and they overwhelmingly voted for it um, last November in the election. And we've seen that determination uh, in the equally overwhelming opposition to the coup and the return of military rule, something that took the generals by surprise. Um, if we can look past the crisis, and I think that doing that we must include looking beyond the military junta, I think a key consideration will be how well the National Unity Cons Consultative Council, which has been established by the NUG, the National Unity Government, has succeeded or will have succeeded in its work of building a cross-ethnic consensus around a federal democratic future for Myanmar. I think that, that's the key to the future. Um, the NUG has recognized that challenge. And uh, just to quote from the uh, NUG's foreign minister, Do Zin Ma Ong, uh, who is herself an eight, a 1988 veteran who spent um, 11 years in prison for her political activities. Quote, we have a vision for state building to end decades long inequality and discrimination. Reconciliation and unity among different ethnic groups is of utmost importance and is the key to ending the military junta, unquote. So that's the challenge. And the NUG, I have to say, has made a good start with its commitment to abolish the 2008 constitution, the, the, the um, racist citizenship laws, uh, and setting up the national unity, the NUCC, uh, with ethnic minority representation to draft a federal uh, democracy charter, which outlines future federal government structures. But it's a long way to go to build the legitimacy and the trust among the ethnic minorities in particular. As we've seen in our own country um, with the treaty processes, process is very, very important. So in Myanmar, there must be an acknowledgement of the past, the horrors of the past, there must be the establishment of new understandings and relationships. And there must be a construction through that process of a shared vision of a just, inclusive society. What does it look like? What does the machinery of government have to be put in place to, to ensure that it um, is not only established, but is sustained? And that is the challenge, the enormous challenge, which the NUG and the NUCC have. And I just raise the question, really, whether this can be achieved by leaders from the past generations who have been so deeply and negatively impacted by the decades of military rule and those poisonous narratives which have promoted, the, the, the military have promoted through the education systems and which are sadly quite well established in cultural norms. We've seen how young leaders from Myanmar coming to New Zealand have embraced the world through education programs and experiences in other countries. Um, we've seen how they've um, engaged with the world through internet and social media. It's no coincidence, as a result, that it was young people who led the protests against the coup. It's their future, it's their children's future that's at stake, and those young men and women of all ethnicities need to be a fundamental part of the 
potentially transformative process that the NUCC is uh, conducting. How can we help them get there? Well, I think we need to maintain a deliberate focus on helping those thousands of young leaders and their organizations to keep their hope of democracy alive. In developing our projects, including possible humanitarian assistance, we need to keep in mind the option of supporting these organizations in a way which continues to build their capacity and that community leadership, which is going to be so crucial for them to lead their countries in the future. They can also learn from our processes for redressing historic grievances. The young leaders who came here on our programs, particularly those from ethnic minorities, which most were, immediately identified with the position of Māori and the Treaty of Waitangi processes. I know Steve has found the same with the leaders of ethnic organisations, many of whom came with him to meet Māori leaders in New Zealand a few years ago. It's hard to look beyond the current crisis in Myanmar, but if we look hard, perhaps there is some hope there. Hope that the involvement of the leaders of the future in the NUCC processes does ensure that the transformative process that it needs to be to establish new understandings and relationships has taken place and that has formed the foundation for a just, inclusive society in Myanmar. And I hope that we in Aotearoa New Zealand uh, will have played a small part in supporting the NUG and the broader democracy movement in Myanmar to achieve mm -hmm. that objective. So that's my message, Suze. Yeah. No, thanks very much, Ross. Um, a, a nice and important note to finish on. Um, we do have a number of questions uh, that have come in um, over the course of our discussion, but I would just like to thank our panel um, for this um, incredible discussion and for the for the points you've shared. Um, I believe we've got roughly 10 minutes and so let me get through as many as we can. Uh, first question from Phil King. The Tatmadaw is sending thousands of troops into some regions, for example, Chin State. Already thousands of civilians have fled to the Mizoram or are living as IDPs. Is it possible we will see an ethnic cleansing operation similar to what we have seen in Rakhine State? Um, Dr. Naya, do you want to, to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have to say it's possible because of the Chin State is a very small state. And the way the oppressing is using the all armed force, the burning downs. Of course, the PDF, it's a starting from the very peaceful, now in terms of defensive manner, they have to fight back. So when they being ambushed and the military come and burn down the whole villages. So it will be also, you know, we can also name it, a, it's a kind of the ethnic cleansing and also different prominent ethnic leader in the oppositions, they also targeted because of that and that's of related and in terms of the ethnicity, so on. So that is a, one of the scary things that we being observed at the moment, and then mm. we really want to prevent not to continue to happen like that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nye. Um, the next question we have is, one of the options that we're looking at, so we could continue to deliver our development projects in Myanmar, is the possibility of having a conversation with the military to share with them the details of our projects, programs and Chin State. We're thinking of this option because the military has now blocked access to certain roads, making it hard for our project team to travel between provinces to deliver works. Question one is, do you think this is a real option to consider? And if not, do you think we should work with the military to work around this issue? Um, do we have, uh, who would like to pick this up? I think that's a question for Steve. Yeah, Steve, would you like to, to respond to Okay. Um, the reality is, is that there is a difference, in my view anyway, between recognition and engagement. Um, and I don't believe anybody is saying that you should not engage for life-saving, life-preservation, humanitarian activities. Um, and frankly, if 
somebody has got access to officials within the SAC system in some way and has got the capacity to discuss with them, engage with them on humanitarian corridors, that is something that we should all be considering and we should all be looking at working on. Um, and I'm sure that actually some of the initiatives that I spoke to before has got that as a key element. But the reality is, is that somebody inside the country, an, an NGO which is non-threatening, may actually be able to have greater inroads than some of the others. Um, so mm. my feeling would be uh, it's not about recognition. You're talking about en engagement for humanitarian ends, and that I would see as something which is necessary. No, thanks very much for that, Steve. Dr. Nye, is, is that your experience on the ground? Um, uh, actually, the Ambassador's Chief uh, response a very, very good one. So one of the things that we uh, need to also care for is that at the moment, it's the events in the last week, um, the UN, WHO, UNICEF, in order to go to the Ministry of Health and Supports to negotiate for the vaccines that being mm -hmm. come from the humanitarian platforms, and then the ministry say that no, it should be a only one system and then they are not really recognize the ethnic health uh, uh, workers and in order to the border. So that, that is a bit of uh, um, challenging, but I totally agree with that Emma just mentioned about the engaging and then recognitions. However, on the other hand, people are very emotional at the moment. So mm -hmm. some, uh, uh, um, you know, well-established NGO or UN go to engage with the, 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 the military government, and then they also say that you recognize and then you engage. So, you know, we, we understand that because there's too much emotions at the moment. So that is a little bit of a challenge and need to be a, a balance. On the other hand, we, have, we also have to be educated to the people because we know that in the equation, military is one. We can't really 100% totally black out there, but we're trying to hope for the best. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question here from Darius um, Mortimer Webster, um, and apologies, I, I'll just read it out. Um, perhaps, uh, Helen, you might like to pick this up. Um, we've heard about genuine dialogue being the only solution for real positive change towards peace building. Even if we have avenues for dialogue, like health issues, COVID-19 primarily, or via the ASEAN forum, and even if multilateral organizations like ASEAN are showing a willingness to involve themselves in sterner stuff, then just written condemnations, how much do these factors matter if all of the major players still believe they have a chance to win, as Steve was stay, saying in this conflict? Mm -hmm. Are there any good practical opportunities to genuinely bring all parties to the table without waiting for more people to, quote unquote, lose? Mm. No, uh, look, I, I, I endorse what Steve said earlier, you know, to get a dialogue on this, it, it, it takes two to tango. And, and at the moment, you know, neither side is particularly interested in that. The, the question is, I guess, to analyse what would bring both to uh, the table. You know, in, in a rational world, uh, the Myanmar military would be extremely concerned about the Myanmar economy being in, in, in free fall, in, in ruins. Uh, but it, it seems that somehow they keep you know, getting their money from you know, the flow of revenues that come out of the extractive sector and so on. And you know, looking at it totally cynically, are prepared to see people literally go to the wall starving and ruined uh, to, to make their point. So, so what changes the dynamic? Are, are there you know, forces within the, the military which uh, might uh, be cautioning uh, against this? One, one is conscious that out of the military, you know, those years ago came uh, someone, Ten Sein, who you know, provided an opening through which um, the National League for Democracy were able to come to power. But we're not hearing any of those voices uh, at, at the moment. Similarly, you know, you can totally emphasize, empathize with the with the NLD. I mean, they won an election fair and square. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're standing on the principle of, of, of that. 
So I think it, it's, it's, this is not going to be quick, in my opinion. I think it's going to require very patient uh, diplomacy. It's going to require engagement. And I think Steve made a, a, a good a distinction between recognition and engagement. The fact that you, you endeavour to engage doesn't bestow recognition. It, it, it's dealing with the reality that somehow you have to negotiate uh, through this in, in, in the end. So that's, that's the way it looks to me. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Ross, is that also your observation in terms of... Um, seeing how on the ground people are having to try and work between um, a rock and a hard place, uh, delivering civil society organisations and so on. Um, is this what you are uh, seeing too? Yeah, I don't think anyone sort of wanted this situation, perhaps other than the military, but having got here, I, I think the, the popular movement see the opportunity to move beyond the 2008 constitution, which with all its um, imperfections and actually create, you know, a new society. And that's still mm. the vision and their ideal and their hope. So, yes, um, that hope is still alive. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, we're going to wrap up there. Um, I would just like to, to really, on behalf of the Asian New Zealand Foundation, the Council for International Development, um, Union Aid, and colleagues who have contributed to this dialogue, uh, Michael Naylor and Don Clark, um, thank you very much uh, to you all for being on today's panel. Um, to our audience, thank you very much for tuning into this important discussion. Um, please do stay tuned with news of what's happening in Myanmar and through your organisations. Uh, please continue to uh, do what you can to, to help the people of Myanmar. I think if this is going to be slow rolling and require a lot of careful footwork over a number of months and careful negotiation, then everyone has their part to play there. So. Um, please do stay uh, connected and engaged. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, with that, our panel session comes to a close.